What I want to talk about is a little story of dysfunctional government in nature that talks about a different problem that everybody gets. And the two players in the game that I'm going to talk about from the federal standpoint are the EPA and the BLM. And also in this mess of three letter words, we have the DEQ, which everybody recognizes as a local Oregon concern. And this one, which you may not know, Dog Amy. And that's the Department of Geology and Mineralogy. And so let's go back to 1987. In 1987, outside of Riddle, a Japanese company called Formosa started a mine. And the Formosa mine had identified that there was copper and zinc there. But in reality, after the fact, we find out that there was gold and platinum there too, and that this is what they were really after, and this is what they told them they were after. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people are familiar with mining chemistry in any way? With mining what? Mining chemistry. Oh. Anyway, there's a pro process that's called a cyanide leach. <clears throat> And the cyanide leach is a specific leaching technique that pulls these heavy metals out of ores. So you get your ore, you crush it nice and fine, you hit it with the cyanide process, and then it dumps the gold and platinum, and these companies would send the cyanide down the stream and kill all the fish. And do crummy things and not really behave. So in 19... 91, the state of Oregon said no, no cyanide leaching. What, what stream was this? What river? This is called Middle Creek. Okay. And Middle Creek leads into Cow Creek. And Cow Creek feeds into the South Umpqua. And the South Umpqua dumps into the Main Umpqua. So this is a one, two, three, fourth field watershed. So whenever you hear them talking about watersheds and they talk about fields, whichever dumps into the river, from, into the ocean from the river is the first field, then the second field, third field, fourth field. So you've got this big hill. You've got a mine dug like this. There's gold and platinum down here. There's copper and zinc and other stuff here and they're digging in and the state of Oregon changes the rules and Formosa says oh, we have our profits like we were going to goodbye and they ask Doug Amy what do we have to do to clean up this site and Doug Amy says well put all your tailings back in the mine oh. and cap it so now we have a mine with a cap but you know what to make this mine, what did they have to do? Blast and drill, yeah. And so all this stuff down here is fissured rock. And so what happens is that Middle Creek coming down through the fissured rock has a pH of approximately 2.3 and no bugs and no fish for 18 miles until it hits Cow Creek. So we have 18 miles of no fish whatsoever in a prime fish-bearing stream. Just the stuff OWIB is saying that we're going to protect and all that. So meanwhile, Formosa is closed. They've gone back to Japan. Dogani told them to dump all the fines back in. And we now have this problem. And who gets involved? The Oregon DEQ. And so the Oregon DEQ comes in and they hire this consulting company named Hart Krauser that's located in Portland. Well, how many people have ever tried to get a government job? When you're trying to consult with the government, you have to be approved by the state legislature in your state even in order to talk to these agencies. And so when we have people locally, who could solve the problem, 
they're not eligible to be consultants because they're not on the list in Salem. So Hart Krauser comes in. This stuff is 17 miles out of Riddle. What is it, 23 miles away from Glendale? This mine is in the middle of nowhere. Hart Krauser comes in. Oh, we better get electricity up here. Huh? No. So they come up with the idea that they're going to set up a limestone channel and they have this pipe called an audit that drips out the acid water into the limestone channel and limestone is fairly basic material and so the thought is that the acid coming onto the limestone would come into the limestone and it would neutralize the pH and the water would come out neutralized. So they loaded up this channel and they used plus one inch limestone. What's going to happen with plus one inch limestone? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing, because no you're going to get the area. acid hit the surface, it's going to coat the surface in the first minute it touches it, and there's no way of breaking down into the limestone to get anywhere. So the whole thing cost four or five million dollars and didn't work. So, after 10 years, the EPA comes in and they declare it a super fun site. And so what do they do? Oh, we're going to study the problem. So they're off studying the problem. I left local sometime, I was in Douglas County until 2007, I lived in Ashland until 2011. Sometime between there was when the EPA took over and this December 2014 was when they announced what their plan was for doing things. And their plan deals with 20% of the problem that is the materials that are on the top of the hill that were buried in our leaching, but the ground, the problem with the mine, they're going to wait another three years to address because the BLM, which owns the land, couldn't wait for the EPA to decide what to do and decided that they wanted to pull this at it. And by pulling this at it, this is where the major portion of the liquid drains out of the mine. So there's one of two things that are going to happen. They're going to seal the attic and higher up on the hill, another leak will start and they'll have to put in another attic. Or the weight of water filling the mine with no outsource is going to cause this to break through and blow out and just be a total disaster in Middle Creek once. And then when it all flushes out, there won't be a mine with a problem because there won't be something holding water. So either way, I think they're all a bunch of idiots. And they've caused this problem and they won't let us work on it. And yet they're coming up with solutions that make no sense. And the fact that the EPA is willing to spend $10 million on 20% of the cleanup and that BLM wants to do some stuff in it that's delaying all this stuff, just tells me that they don't know what they're doing and that we the people need to formally ask them to cease and desist and get off our land. I don't know about down here in Jackson County, but the federal government through the BLM and the U.S. Forest Circus owns 53% of Douglas County. That's kind of ridiculous when the Constitution of the United States says that they can own forts and post offices and not any other land. But you know what? I no longer think that the government of the United States is in control here. Mm -hmm. I think the people who are in control here are Zuckerman of Facebook and the guy who runs Google and those people. The corporations have taken over to the point where they control our Congress, tell them what to do, and representation without representation is what we get. Because we're only given a choice of voting for the blue guy or the red guy, and neither one, they're both in the purple party, working for the government, and they need to be made purple. Do we have any thugs available? You know, that's the problem. 
you want to vote, you want to do something, and there isn't anyone to vote for who is representing us. So Lenny, how would you fix that? How would you do it? Just how would I do it? I would go down to the place where Middle Creek hits Cow Creek, where the pH is about five, but it's still kind of low. And I would start by doing stuff on the sides of both sides of the river to make the water through through buffers and composts and work my way up the river and first recover as much fish territory as I could get. Simultaneously, I would open the mine, dig out the fines, and start mining it again because realistically spending $30 million to clean up a problem that's a mine that can yield $100 million. But there's a tacit war on mining in this country. And I worked at the nickel mine up in Reading up until they passed NAFTA and GATT. That was only the first hammer. But realistically, Look at California and the mining industry. There are gold mines that were totally productive in the 1920s and 1930s. And now, somehow the sites have disappeared from all the maps. Yep. Yep. And so, we know they're there, but finding them is sort of interesting. I've been working as a mining chemist since 1994. And I know some people who we've tried to get some private mines going. And by the time you get them permitted and that stuff and jump through those hoops, and then get the equipment that you need to get, because first you got to dig the rock, then you got to crush the rock, then you got to process what's in there, and then you got to get your metals out of your process materials. And so at the nickel mine, it was fairly easy because they got ore that was 3% nickel crated in from New Caledonia and driven by truck from Coos Bay to Riddle because that was cheaper than mining U.S. soil. And uh, so anyway, that process was able to make nickel at about $3 a pound. So when the process NAFTA and GATT passed and the price of nickel fell to two and a half dollars a pound, you couldn't blame the company for closing shop and leaving. They weren't getting the money. Does anybody offhand know the price of nickel today? I think it's somewhere around 17. So how do you mine them without losing cyanide? I don't have all the details. But there are various different wages that you can get the gold and silver, but the copper and the zinc, which are the main ore body, don't require cyanide treatment at all. And the fact is, I think the company could have continued to do the mining for copper and zinc. I was not working for this company. I was working for another company in another mine about 30 miles away. But I got involved in this because of the hassle. And I have been bird dogging this for at least 20 years. There's another guy, Larry Tuttle, with the Center for Environmental Equity up in Portland, who's also been bird dogging it. And so between the two of us, we will not let them tell lies to the public when they come to Riddle to talk to us. Okay, now that I've told you a little bit about another environmental problem in Southern Oregon, for the next half hour, 45 minutes, I'll open up the field to any questions you want to ask me in the field of chemistry or the environment and see where it takes us. Well, on the current subject, okay, something that you said actually hit on an idea I had a long time ago, and I want to see what you think the viability of this is. When you look at the majority of national forest and wilderness and BLM land, they are full of dead, of abandoned mines, abandoned mine equipment, tailings piles, uh, and most of them are causing uh, really, really bad environmental problems, especially in states like Colorado. Um, 
Yeah, bad, bad. Um, what do you think? I mean, why don't we mine that? I mean, with the technologies that we have today and what we understand today, we should be able to go in there, take care of the environmental problem, and walk away with enough metals to more pay for the project. And then since it's public land, profits go to us. First off, I believe the government believes that they are the public owners of the public land and that that <laughs> is in debate. However, I agree full heartedly that the mining industry, well, the mining industry worldwide is a couple, a bunch of big companies like Comenco or Tech or several others. And they're as corporate as everybody else. I'd love to try and do things with a whole nother structure than the corporate system that we have. But it struck me now when you started bringing up your question that one of the things I could have answered to Lucretia's question when how would I do it? When we were at the nickel mine, we looked at two areas of concern called phyto mining and myco mining. And phyto has to do with plants, myco with mushrooms. And what we found was that certain plants would hyperaccumulate metals, certain mushrooms would hyperaccumulate metals. And so we could grow brassicas in half percent nickel soil and get 5% of the weight of the cauliflower or the broccoli being nickel. They picked up that much nickel. So if the process takes the ore, crushes it up, and uses charcoal and activated carbon, coke and coal, to be the oxidant in the smelting process, why can't we use broccoli and cauliflower as part of the carbon base to throw in to use as the reducing agent in the process and also add to our yields? I wouldn't want to eat a broccoli that was 5% nickel, but feeding it to an oven, drying it, and then using it as a carbon source? Yeah. In fact, all this stuff that you hear in the world about carbon is a dead herring, and the stuff they're trying to impose on us with carbon taxes and carbon trading and that is totally non-reality based in the least. It's agenda 21. <laughs> Very much could be. <coughs> when I was involved with a company called Wonder Earth Partners, we took 660 acres out by Boomer Hill up near Roseburg, and we took a high school class that I had trained to do forestry and measured 13 different plots on that land, used aerial photography, and estimated that we had 600 million tons of carbon sequestered in the trees that the landowner was preparing to log. And that by not logging those trees with a clear cut and putting that carbon onto the Chicago Climate Exchange, we could have a carbon source that was not going into the atmosphere and would qualify based on the rules they gave. So for about 10 years, we went and tried to market this carbon. And what we found out was that the whole carbon trading was a collusion between big corporations and big governments, and that no physical carbon traded hands at all, and there was nothing under it. And if you really did have the physical carbon, they didn't want any part of you. We complained to the Securities and Exchange Commission. The Chicago Climate Exchange was shut down in 2009. Interesting how life works. You know how we change all this? We change all this by ignoring everything we're doing and just doing things on our own with each other in our own way. We stop paying them taxes, we stop paying them mortgages, we stop using their banks, right. and we just do everything stop servicing all from new. 
And if we can just create what we want, I have a feeling that within the next year, what you're going to see is a real untrenchment of the, let's say, the axis of evil, which is not China, Russia, and North <laughs> Korea, but has a lot to do with the fact that corporations were made people by the Supreme Court, and we have a document called the Constitution that nobody is expected to follow, yet a legal system where they can thrust through laws that we're not even told about and we're expected to know that ignorance is not an excuse and the only thing that we can do to not be subject to the laws is pay them more of their money that the banks have printed for them that they loan us at interest. <laughs>